ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدع وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار وما قل وكفى خير مما كثر والها وانما توعدون لات وما انتم بمعجزين Alhamdulillah we praise due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we praise him we glorify him we seek refuge in him from the evil within our own selves and from the evil consequences of our actions whomever Allah guides no one can lead him or her astray after that and whomever Allah allows to go astray none can guide him after that verily the most truthful speech is the book of Allah the best of guidance is the guidance of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the worst of matters are those things that are innovations in our religion for they lead astray and into the hellfire my brothers and sisters today in this moment of time and on every day of our lives we stand between one event and another we stand between one minute and the next minute we stand be- between the time that passed and the time that's coming this week for many people unfortunately is a very special day coming on sunday sunday is a special day for many brothers and sisters and that's the day where there's a sports match the super bowl and just a few days ago there was another sports match another event a tragic event in country of Egypt a football match or a soccer match where 75 people or more than that lost their lives so because we stand between these two events and so many of our muslim brothers and sisters are involved in these types of activities i wanted to take a look today at the time we waste so the theme of my khutbah today is time from an islamic perspective because we as muslims unfortunately we're like everyone else there's nothing special about us except for what we have but we waste time like everyone else so events like these if we don't learn from them if we don't wake up from events and situations like this where people spend hours and hours of their time and i'm not making any judgment whether you should watch the game or not we're just making an observation and learning lessons as believers the importance of time The Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam he said ni'matan maghbunun fihi ma kathirun min an-nas as-sihha wal faragh The Prophet said in a sound hadith there are two blessings two blessings of God that most human beings and he used the term human being not just Muslims because this is a universal teaching there are two blessings of God that most people waste that most people squander before it's too late 
Number one, the blessing of health. And number two, the blessing of time. Most of us, we take these blessings, we take them for granted until they're too late. When's the last time we, thought, we thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us two legs, for giving us two hands, for allowing us to walk to the masjid? Simple things that we take for granted. But when they're taken away from us, when illness strikes and we no longer can walk, or we no longer can talk, or we no longer can breathe without machine, then we start thinking of these blessings that we squandered. The same thing with time. When you look at time, most of us waste so much of it until we have no time, and then we regret. So our lives, basically when we look behind our lives, it's like a blur. And everyone, I want everyone to think about his or her life. Think about all the days that passed. How old are you? How many years you spent in this planet? Think about those days. Does it seem like a long period of time or it seems like a blur? Something that passed very quickly. That's the nature of time. When you look back, it's something that's gone so fast. But when you look to the future, it seems like you have so much of it. So you look to the future, oh, I have the rest of my life. I have the rest of my life to get in order, to come back to Allah, to rectify myself, to take care of things. And we keep procrastinating. But when you look back, it seems like it's a blur. It went very, very fast. So my brothers and sisters, in this khutbah, we want to take a look at the blessing of time. A blessing as the Prophet والسلام, he said, ni'matan, he described it as a ni'mah, something that Allah gave us as a bounty, that's a gift. That's a blessing. I want to take a look at another <coughs> teaching of the Prophet ﷺ that's related to time. It's a prophecy. It's a hadith related by Abu Huraira, the companion radiallahu an, who relates that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, and this hadith is in Bukhari. The Prophet made a prediction, a prophecy. And that's part of being a prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals revelation. He gives information to these individuals who are prophets about the future. And they give these predictions to people in an attempt to rectify their lives. So our Prophet ﷺ, 1400 years ago, he said some words. He said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى يقبض العلم He said, the hour will not be established. And this is the style of the Prophet when he says that it means that the day of judgment will never come until these things happen. It's a prediction. It means these things are going to happen towards the end of time before the world comes to an end. So the Prophet said, لا تقوم الساعة The day of judgment will not come until... And he made some predictions, a number of things. Five things. حتى يقبض العلم The first thing he said, until knowledge will be lifted. And then he said, وَتَكْثُرَ zalazil," And earthquakes will increase. وَيَتَقَارَبَ zaman," And time will pass very, very quickly. وَتَذْهَرَ fitan," And chaos will prevail. وَيَكْثُرَ الْحَرَجْ وَهُوَ الْقَتَلَ الْقَتَلَ And killing or murder will increase. The loss of life will increase. حَتَّى يَكْثُرَ فِيكُمُ الْمَالِ فَيَفِيضُ and until there will be a surplus of wealth among you. So five things the Prophet predicted. Let's take a look at each and every one of them and apply them to our lives. Number one, he said, knowledge will be lifted. Now we talked about this in the past to some extent. Let's look at the life that we live in, the age and the era that we live in. Knowledge will be lifted. Ask yourselves a question, do we live in a time where there's a lot of knowledge or there's less knowledge. And you have to keep in mind what knowledge is. Knowledge is very different from information. Yes, we live in the information age. We live in an age of technology, of literacy. People on the planet are reading, there's a literacy rate like never before. And we have access to resources we've never had before. But ask yourselves, are we smarter now than we were? Do we have more knowledge now than we, than we used to have? No. The sad reality is, as information is increasing, knowledge is becoming scarce. 
So you find all this information around us. You have the internet, you have Yahoo and Google and Wikipedia. You can look up any single thing you want and find loads and loads of information on that. We have access to so many resources we never had. In this masjid, right in the back, we have a library. It's a library dedicated to one of my teachers and one of the imams who was an imam in this masjid many years ago. Sheikh Dr. Abdul Muta'al Al-Jabri, rahimahullah ta'ala, who passed away many years ago. He was a great scholar, a great author, who inspired many people. But when he passed away, he left so many books behind, volumes and volumes of books. And he donated them to this masjid. And we built a library in his name. You go into this library, it has his name on a plaque. And you see all these volumes of books in there. Some of them 40 volumes, 30 volumes of knowledge. Now we have it at our fingertips. It's right there, you can pick it up. But are we using that knowledge? Is it in our hearts, is it in our lives? It's just there on the shelves. Today, you can download any book you want. Now we have devices, and, and, and the younger generation, they can testify to that. You have kids with devices, like the Kindle, and the iPhone, and the iPad, all these things. They can download any single title you want. You tell them the name of a book, within seconds they can have it. But despite this increase of information, if you look around in our country here today, and you look around the world today, is there more knowledge or is there more ignorance? And I think we all know the answer to that. Just look at, you know, this country. Right now we're in the middle of an election. Or the election is very far away, but there's election fever. There's campaigns. And you have the Republicans going on and on about these debates. When you look at these debates, and you look at the people who may possibly be the president or the leader of this country, and you look at the statements they make, really, it boggles your mind that these people, you know, where did they go to school? Is there any education? Do they have any knowledge? You find so many ridiculous statements from them. You find that as people progress, they're not becoming more knowledgeable. Rather, where we as a society are becoming more ignorant. We're becoming, we're going backwards. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, one of the purposes of the different colors and races we have, this diversity, is to increase recognition and tolerance. Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqunakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'il lita'arafu. Allah mentions the wisdom of why He created different continents, different countries, different climates, different colors, different languages. He says we created all of these nations and tribes. Why? لِتَعَارَفُوا So you may recognize one another. You may know one another. What does that mean? That means that you can have the knowledge of one another. You can understand each culture. You can be respectful and tolerant. But when you look at the world today, we're less and less tolerant. There's more talk of anti this or anti this or anti that, anti immigrant feeling, anti Muslim feelings, Islamophobia against this country or that country. And we as Muslims are no different. You go into our Muslim countries, you know, the Indians are against the Pakistanis, the Pakistanis against the Bengalis. In Egypt, you know, when there's a, a soccer match between Egypt and Algeria, look at what happens. It's our own Muslim brothers and sisters. Instead of becoming more tolerant, because recognizing one another, we're becoming against one another. That means in general, the point, my brothers and sisters, despite the increase of information, we're becoming more ignorant as a society. We're becoming less educated as a society. And that has nothing to do with degrees. Although we have more degrees, more masters, more PhDs than ever before. But as a society, as a planet, as a world, we are becoming more and more ignorant. And knowledge is being lifted. So Sadaqa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he said, فَيُقْبَضَ الْعِلْمِ Knowledge will be lifted from the world. And then he said, وَتَكْثُرَ الزَّلَازِلِ It's the second thing he mentioned as a prophecy, earthquakes will increase. Now you look at the last few years of our lives, look at how many earthquakes we've witnessed in different parts of the world, in Indonesia, in Pakistan, in different regions, in Haiti, so many earthquakes. And it, it's not an exaggeration to see that this phenomenon is increasing. So these types of natural disasters seem to be increasing over the years when you compare to the previous years. Now there's a National Earthquake Information Center that keeps statistics. 
And according to their statistics, they locate, or they, there's about 20,000 earthquakes each year. And most of them are minor, some of them are major, but 20,000 earthquakes each year. That means there's about 50 earthquakes every single day happening somewhere on this planet. And there's about 17 major earthquakes per year. If you look at the last few years, so when you look at that, you know, you realize that this phenomenon most likely is increasing. Now, some scientists might disagree and they'll say it's been like that, but I think anyone who looks at the data will recognize that earthquakes, natural disasters, tsunamis, all these things seem to be increasing. We seem to have these variable weather elements that are increasing and affecting our societies all across the world. So the Prophet, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَتَكْثُرَ الزَّلَازِلِ Earthquakes will increase and that as a metaphor for natural disasters But primarily it's the earthquakes and many of these are caused by or even the tsunamis are caused by earthquakes beneath the ocean surface So that's number two It's a prediction of the Prophet that we can see in our lives And then he said And this was the topic of our khutbah He said Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Time will pass very very quickly And when you look around you can ask yourself, all of us can testify to that, how quickly the time goes now. The weeks turn into months, days turn into weeks, how quickly time goes, hours turn into days. You know, you don't know where the time goes. It's so quick, you go to school and before you know you're graduating, then you're in college, then you have children. Time is going very, very quickly. There's, a, there, there's no barakah, there's no blessing in time. So you talk to anybody here, especially in this country, do you have any time? No one has time. Everyone feels the crunch of time. Everyone's running from one place to another. And it's, and, and it's no exaggeration, zaman. Time is passing very, very quickly. And then the Prophet, he said, وَتَذْهَرَ fitan. He said, there will be an increase of fitan. Fitan is a plural of fitna. And fitna in general means chaos instability, disorder. So the Prophet said at the end of time, disorder, chaos, instability will, will increase. When you look around the world today, we see that today. Look at the Arab Spring, the Wall Street movement, all these phenomena. Look at all the, you know, the violence and the turmoil in our societies. Look at the people losing their life. Generally, it's safe to say that there's more chaos and instability in the world than stability. So this is another prediction of the Prophet that we can testify to. No one, you know, only the blind person will not see that. Despite being in the 21st century, despite being superpowers, despite being, you know, educated like never before, yet we find more wars than ever before. We have our nation, the enlightened nation. Our nation is supposed to be the leader of the free world. How many wars we're meddling in? How many wars are we involved in? And all around the world, how much killing and chaos and wars and instability all around the world. And it seems to be increasing every single year. So, tadhar al fitan, that increase of chaos and instability. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, wa yakthur al haraj. He said, haraj will increase. And then he defined it, wa huwa al qatl al qatl. He said, basically, loss of life will increase, murder will increase. Loss of life will increase. And you look at the world today, you know, previously with all the wars put together, the Crusades and all the wars we had, if you look at the conflicts we have today and look at the, compare the numbers with the loss of human life, you can't compare it. Before you used to have a war, maybe a thousand people would die, 500 people would die in a major war. Now the numbers are hundreds of thousands to millions. In the Iraq war, you know, the estimates range from depending on who's counting and, you know, what agenda the person has. But, you know, how many people died in, in, in Iraq from our involvement in the last few conflicts? You know, the numbers, if you ever think about the numbers, it's, it's mind-boggling. The number, the most conservative estimates are a few hundred thousand. Nobody would deny that. We killed a few hundred thousand people. And according to other estimates, a few million people. So you're looking at between a few hundred thousand to a few million people that died as a result of our involvement in this country. Now we're not making a judgment about what happened, is it better off or worse off, but we're just looking at the numbers. Hundreds of thousands of people dead. 
In Syria today, there's a government cracking down on its people, murdering its own citizens. You know, a few weeks ago, the number was 3,000. Now it's up to more than 5,000 people dead. And these are people, not an army fighting against each other. These are common people in the streets. So a few thousand people killed in the last few months in one particular country. And I mentioned in the beginning this football match, a stupid game, playing ball between two you know, clubs within Egypt. Almost 80 people died. Ask yourselves, is it worth it? So all these people who defend sports and you know, well, there's nothing wrong with that, but look at this, look at what's happening. 80 people lost their life. How will those people answer Allah on the day of judgment? And you know, Allah, He looks at everything. It's not just the players. It's everyone who was involved in that. Every single person who was involved in something that led to loss of life, you'll be questioned about that on the day of judgment. There's different degrees of responsibility. But if someone's standing there, you know, and you see something going on in front of you, and you don't take control of the situation, or you contribute to it, you're responsible. It's not just the person pulling the trigger. But the person who's allowing that to happen is guilty. The person who washed is guilty. The person who didn't teach these people to some extent is guilty. And those of us who don't teach our people the value of time, the value of not wasting time, to some extent we're guilty. So, وَيَكْثُرَ الْحَرَجْ وَهُوَ الْقَتَلِ The Prophet said وسلم, Killing will increase. Or the loss of life will increase. And we can see that today. And the last thing he mentioned, حَتَّى يَكْثُرَ فِيكُمُ الْمَالِ فَيَفِيضُ Until wealth will become superfluous. There will be an abundance of monetary wealth and it will be circulated uh, or it will uh, overflow. Now this prophecy perhaps, you know these prophecies are ilm al ghaib Some of them are very obvious, we can say without a doubt that they came true. Some of them, Allahu A'lam. So when it comes to the prophecies, we need to have some humility. We can't say for sure that this refers to this thing or that thing, but you know, some, according to some scholars, this is true because when you look at the, the gap between you know, the very wealthy and the very poor, it's widening. And when you look at the very wealthy, they have more wealth than ever before. The number of billionaires now is more than the number of billionaires 10 years ago. The number of millionaires in the world today is much greater than the number of millionaires about 10 years ago. And I have the statistic, those who are interested. So it seems like wealth is increasing in the hands of a few. But Allahu A'lam, perhaps the Prophet meant that it would increase among everyone until at the end of time. But my brothers and sisters, the point of this prophecy and the point of every prophecy of the Prophet wasalam, it's not to make predictions and to be interested by them, but it's to change our lives. All these have to do with the end of times, the day of judgment. As the Prophet ﷺ, he was giving one of these prophecies. He was talking about the day of judgment. And one man stood up and he asked the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, Mata Sa'a, O Messenger of Allah, when is the day of judgment? And you know what the Prophet said to him? He told him, You missed the point. He said, Wailak, wa ma addatta laha. He said, Woe unto you. The question you need to be asking is not when is the day of judgment or when all of these prophecies are, being, are, are coming true or how much time we have or what year is going to end as some people are fascinated by. But the question is what are we doing to prepare for that day? These prophecies should increase our iman and our yaqeen, our conviction that this day is coming and should increase that resolve. But the question we need to ask ourselves is, that day is coming for sure. There's no doubt about it. What are we doing about that day? What are we doing to prepare ourselves? What are we doing? Are we ready? Suppose that day were to come very soon. Are we ready to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We ask Allah to make us among the people of iman and taqwa and yaqeen and people who follow in the footsteps of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah aliyun. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه 
أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد. So my brothers and sisters, today we're looking at the topic of time, and we mentioned the motivation for this topic was the fact that there was this game in which people lost their life. And there's another game in two days where a lot of Muslims will be wasting their time and energy and resources. So at moments like this, we need to look at what Islam says about time, what the Prophet said about time, and what we as believers, what are the lessons we need to learn. So we share this beautiful prediction of the Prophet that's certainly true and that increases our conviction that he was a Prophet, he predicted the future with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I want to share in this last portion some principles of time. Four principles relating to time in Islam. Number one, and we alluded to number one already, time is a great gift. It's a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first thing. We need to know that time is something very valuable. It's something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. And it's something we should value and work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, He swears by time, not in one place, not in two places, but in many, many places. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whenever He swears by anything, He takes an oath in the Qur'an, our scholars say, that means that's something that He swears by, it's something very great. It's something that has tremendous value and it has worth. So when Allah swears by something, we should pause and reflect on those items because they're very valuable. So among the things Allah swears by is time in more than one place of the Qur'an. Allah says, the, the verse we all know, وَلَا asr إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْر Allah says, I swear by time, directly. He swears by time. And He says, all human beings are in a state of loss. So Allah swears by time in Surah Al-Asr. And he tells us everyone is lost except those who do four things. And then there are other verses he swears by different aspects of time. He swears by the sun and the washams wal qamar, washams wa duhaha wal qamari idha talaha. Allah swears by the sun and the moon, which is what drives the day and the night. It's also talking about time. Allah, talk, Allah swears by the morning hours and the night hours, also alluding to time. وَالضُّحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى He swears by the day and the night. So all these different aspects, Allah is reminding us of the value of time. Because He refers to time in various forms throughout the Qur'an. And all of these are referring to time. So time, my brothers and sisters, is a great blessing. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, نِعْمَتَان He told people about these blessings. He said, نِعْمَتَان Two blessings. مَغْبُونٌ فِيهِمَا كَثِيرٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ most people are cheated out of two blessings. And one of them is health, and one of them is time. So the first principle of time is, we need to value it. Don't waste it, but value it. Recognize that this is all we have. This is something very, very valuable. Number two, the second principle, as human beings, we need to recognize that sometimes we tend to lose track of time. It's one of those things you can't grab, you can't hold on to. And in general, we tend to lose track of time. As I mentioned, when you look back at your life, if you're 30 years old, 37 years old, 50 years old, you look at all those years, where did they go? It happened so fast. And then you won't find a single person that say, you know what, it was a long life I lived, and you know, alhamdulillah, every single person feels it went by too fast. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this phenomenon in the Quran. In Surah Al-Baqarah about the person who Allah miraculously caused to die. And he raised them up after a hundred years. فَأَمَاتَهُ اللَّهُ مِئَةَ عَامٍ ثُمَّ بَعَثَ قَالَ كَمْ لَبِثْتْ قَالَ لَبِثْتُ يَوْمًا أَوْ بَعْضَ يَوْمٍ Allah says, and we caused this person to die for a hundred years, then we raised them up. And we asked him, how long were you gone? Asleep. And that man, what did he say? A hundred years he was dead. Or asleep for a hundred years. And he said, لَبِثْتُ يَوْمًا أَوْ بَعْضَ يَوْمٍ He says, I think Allah, I was maybe one day or maybe half a day, I was sleeping. So a hundred years went by like that. We know the story of the youth that escaped Roman persecution, the sleepers of the cave, who 
they, you know, they believed in Allah and to escape the persecution of their religion, they took refuge in a cave and Allah caused them to sleep for 300 years. And what did they say? قَالَ قَائِلٌ مِّنْهُمْ كَمْ لَبِثْتُمْ قَالُوا لَبِثْنَا يَوْمًا أَوْ بَعْضَ يَوْمٍ They slept for 300 years in this cave. When they woke up, they thought it was time for dinner. They talked to each other, go get, get us some dinner. They thought they went to sleep in the morning and they woke up at dinner time. And Allah says, one of them said, how long were we out? And the other one said, maybe a day, maybe half a day or a part of a day. 300 years. So my brothers and sisters, that's the reality of life. We tend to lose track of time. And it's, this is something very, very important. On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about the disbelievers, the mujrimin. He uses the term in the Quran, mujrimin, those who are sinners. Allah says, يَوْمَ يُنْفَخُ فِي الصُّورِ وَنَحْشُرُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ زُرْقًا يَتَخَافَتُونَ بَيْنَهُمْ إِنْ لَبِثْتُمْ إِنْ لَا عَشْرًا نَحْنُ عَالَمُ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ إِذْ يَقُولُ أَمْثَلُهُمْ طَرِيقَةً إِنْ لَبِثْتُمْ إِلَّا يَوْمًا Allah recalls a conversation or He tells us about the conversation the mujrimin, the sinners, those who are unjust will have on the Day of Judgment after spending an entire life here and then an entire turning till the end of time and then the Day of Judgment happens they're arguing with each other about how, many, how much time they had and they're talking like it was only a day or ten days or so on and so forth. So my brothers and sisters, we need to realize time is something that passes very quickly and we tend to lose track of it. That's the third, second principle. Number three, we never have enough of time. No matter how much time we have, it's never going to be enough. So that's something we need to realize. No one's going to have enough time. There's no one you'll find in the world who'll say, you know what? I had enough time, I'm ready to die. Everyone wants more time. Allah talks about a person in the Quran, There will be a person who, even if he was given a thousand years of life, at the end of his life, at the time of death, he would want more. So this is, there's no limit to time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about that. When, and He talks about it in several verses. When people will be called to death, they will ask for more time. If you only, oh Allah, just give us a little more time. Oh Allah, just give us a few more days. So really it's something we never have enough of. No matter how much time you live, some, some of us live to 70 years, 80 years, some of us, mashallah, may Allah give, them, give all of us a long life, 90 years, some of us younger, some of us die at a young age. But if you ask the one who lived 90 years or 100 years, was it a long life? No. Everyone is in the same boat. It's just a few hours, it passes very quickly. So we never really have enough of time. There's something they call time poverty. Today you feel the crunch of time. No one has enough of it, everyone wants more. And the last principle, and that's my point, principle number four. Yes, time passes very quickly. Time is a great blessing. And you never have enough of it, but at the same time, the most important principle is time is all we have. We have nothing other than time. Allah gave us in this world time. He gave us a few days or a few years to do something. And based on this little time we had, is going to determine our destination for all eternity. May Allah give us all a good ending. But time... You know, despite not, never having enough, despite all of these factors, it's the only thing we have. There's nothing else that we have. Hassan al-Basri, the great Imam, he said, Yabna Adam, innaka innama anta ayyam, kullama dhahaba yawmun dhahaba ba'du. He said, O oh son of man, you're just a bunch of days. Your life, every single one of us, our life is just a number of days. You can count them at the end of your life. You can count how many days you lived in this world. So Hassan al-Basri, he said, Oh, son of man, oh, human being, you're just a number of days. Every time one day passes, a part of you is gone forever. So all we have is time. So sometimes we look in the past and we're regretful. It seems it, it went so fast. And then when we look in the future, it seems like we have so much time. You know, I have all the rest of my life to get my life in order. You know, I can, I'll start coming to the masjid later on or I'll start becoming religious when I get married, and so on and so on. When you look to the future, it seems like you have forever. When you look to the past, it seems like you have nothing. But we forget to live in the present. 
So that's the point, my brothers and sisters. We need to live in the present. Our moment is the only thing we have. And Hassan he said something else. He said, you have three things. The past, the present, and the future. Every person is in between these three things. The past is gone forever. The future hasn't come. The only moment you have is the moment you're standing in. So we need to take advantage of that and connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Start living in the present, my brothers and sisters. Start valuing time and start living in the moment. Start taking advantage of the moment you have because the future is not guaranteed. The next moment is not guaranteed. The next minute is not guaranteed. So we need to live in the present. And I'll mention one thing and we'll continue this theme in the next uh, khutbah. Uh, we need to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we want barakah of time, if we want to take advantage of our time, the most important thing is worship. That's what Allah created us for. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I created human beings and I created jinn only for one reason, to worship me. So that's the best thing we can do with our time. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, he said, الدُّنْيَا سَاعَةً فَجَعَلْهَا طَاعَةً The world is like an hour or a brief moment of time. So make it a moment of worship. Make it a moment of worship. So every moment, try to focus yourself on worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salah is the best type of worship. Praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala five times a day gets your life in order. Allah said, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا Allah says this salah is placed over human being in fixed time intervals. Why? So we can take advantage of the moment. Salah is the best time management tool for believers. So my brothers and sisters, let's live in the moment. Let's take advantage of every opportunity we have to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to connect with Him and to get closer with Him. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan wa rizukna tiba'a wal baatila baatila wa rizukna ishtinaba Allahumma tawaffana muslimin wal hikna bis salihin ghayra khazaya wa lam haftunin Allahumma aslih lana deenana alladhi huwa ismatu amrina وأصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا وأصلح لنا آخرة التي إليها معادنا وجعل الحياة زيادة لنا من كل خير والموت راحة لنا من كل شر اللهم اكفنا بحلالك عن حرامك وأغننا بفضلك عمن سواك اللهم آمين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين
also in uh, Masjid al tawheed our sister Masjid, they have a blood drive today. So at 3 o'clock, there's a blood drive where you can donate blood and it goes to people in need. And we as Muslims, we need to get involved in the betterment of society. And this is the way, by contributing to reaching out to everyone, Muslim, non-Muslim, who are in need. So things like coke drive, like blood drives, and, and uh, canned food drive, these are very important. This is something that we are enjoying to do in our religion. And it's something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look at. Uh, and it's something that we should all be encouraged to do. Islam is not just about coming to the mosque and worshiping Allah, but making society better, contributing to society. So with that, it's still a sahimu. The students in the back line up and try to remain silent. Allah Akbar. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Malik Yawm Al-Din Iyaka Na'bud wa Iyaka Nasta'in Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim Sirat Al-Ladina An'amta Alayhim غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين سبح اسم ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله رثاء أحوى سنقلئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء الله إنه يعلم الجهر وما يخفى ونيسرك لليسرى فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى سيذكر من يخشى ويتجنبها الأشقى الذي يصلى النار الكبرى ثم لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا قد أفلح من تزكى وذكر اسم ربه فصلى بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا والآخرة خير وأبقى إن هذا لفي الصحف الأولى صحف إبراهيم وموسى الله سمي الله من حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين 